So entering a new world means encountering new experiences, new opportunities, and new challenges. Advancements in medical care have vastly increased the lifespan of humans, and in the past 50 years alone, many countries have experienced a 10-year increase in the average life expectancy. While this has allowed for greater exploration into many aspects of life, it has also increased the influence of one of scientists' greatest adversaries, cancer. Cancer is a complicated puzzle requiring sensitive tools for detection and monitoring and tailored treatments for curative intent. Longevity comes at a price, but cancer research is pushing the boundaries of how cancer can be detected, monitored, and treated. Now, this may come as a shock to some, but the idea that cancer can be completely cured has only been in the minds of scientists for the past 100 years or so. Prior to that, there was never a way to fully rid a patient of disease, so cancer was seen as almost unbeatable. Slow and steady research now has allowed for scientists to dream of this complete cure, but it is not as easy as it seems. As I said, cancer is a complicated puzzle, and to find a complete cure, there are a few pieces that we need to be able to fit together. First, scientists need to understand the basic molecular mechanisms that underlie cancer. Questions such as, how does cancer affect DNA composition? How does cancer affect cell division, cell growth? What genes are involved, et cetera, will need to be answered. Second, sensitive and accurate detection techniques will need to be developed for earlier and more accurate cancer detection. And this is important because it determines the course of treatment that a patient can have, and early detection correlates with higher survival rates. Um, third, and arguably maybe the most important part of a cure, is having tailored treatments. And these treatments need to be specific for disease, so patient experiences maximum benefits with minimal side effects. And lastly, we need a way to track dynamic molecular changes in disease. And this really helps, especially throughout the course of treatments, in case doctors need to make any adjustments to, to the course of treatment for a patient, and also monitor the possibility of relapse. But before I get into any future ideas circulating in cancer research now, it is always a good idea to look where we have been so that we know where we are going. So I'd like to take you through what I call an accelerated history of cancer research. And I know it's late in the day, but when I say accelerated, I do mean accelerated, so please pay close attention because there will be a quiz at the end. <laughs> I'm just kidding about the quiz. But... Okay, so I'm going to start all the way back in 1775 when a man named... Percival Pott discovered the first connection between an environmental hazard and cancer when he found that soot caused scrotal cancer in chimney sweeps. In 1863, Rudolf Virchow first coined the term leukemia when he found white blood cells in cancer tissue. And in 1886, the inheritance of cancer risk was identified. And in 1902, the, there was a connection established between tumors and chromosome damage. In 1909, it was discovered that the immune system continuously tries to prevent cancer, called immune surveillance. In 1911, Peyton Rouse identifies infectious agents that cause cancer in chickens. In 1915, coal tar is found to cause cancer in rabbits, establishing a connection between chemical agents and cancer for the first time. And in 1960, the Philadelphia chromosome is identified, which is a small chromosome that is found in the majority of leukemias. In 1964, the Epstein-Barr virus, you may know it as the virus that causes mono, is connected to cancer. And in 1976, oncogenes, which are genes that when mutated are always overexpressed and lead to cancer, are identified in chickens, which leads to the, to the identification of the TP53 gene, which is the most mutated gene in cancer in 1979, followed by the HER2 oncogene in 1984. Also in 1984, the HPV was connected to cervical cancer for the first time. And in 1986, that HER2 oncogene was cloned, meaning it could be studied in model systems outside the human body. And that led to the BRCA1 gene being cloned in 1994, followed by the BRCA2 gene in 1995, two commonly mutated genes in breast cancer. And finally, in 2014, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project was started to sequence all cancer types. So these are just, <laughs> oh, thank you. These, it's not over yet. <laughs> these are just some major points that happened in understanding molecular mechanisms behind disease. So now I'm going to take you through again, because it was so much fun the first time for some milestones in cancer treatment. So in 1882, William Halstead performs the, performs the first radical mastectomy to cure breast cancer with grotesque disfigurement of women, and this continued for the next few decades. And in 1903, saw the first eradication, eradication of um, a tumor via radiation in 1932. The radical mastectomy became the modified radical mastectomy with far less disfigurement. In 1937, breast sparing surgery followed by radiation became, became the... the the main way for breast cancer therapy. 
And in 1941, hormonal therapy was used for the first time, which is the manipulation of hormones in the body to cure cancer. In 1947, Sidney Farber, a powerhouse in the history of cancer research, and I suggest you remember this name for later, discovers that antifolates are, can cause remission in ch children with leukemia. And in 1949, nitrogen mustard, yes, the same nitrogen mustard used in World War I, is approved in cancer treatment. In 1953, saw the first complete eradication of a solid tumor. And in 1958, combination chemotherapy was used for the first time with extreme side effects but remarkable success rates. And in 1978, tamoxifen, which is so widespread, many of you have probably heard of it, has, was approved in breast cancer treatment. And then 1985, breast conserving surgery followed by radiation becomes the standard in breast cancer treatment. And the next decade or so sees the development of some of the most common chemotherapy agents, including in 1996, a nostrizol for breast cancer, 1997, rituximab for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and 1998, trastuzumab for breast cancer, 2001, and montanin mesylate for chronic myeloid leukemia, 2011, and pilumab for melanoma, and in 2013, autotrastuzumab emtazine for breast cancer, and in 2014, pembrolizumab for melanoma as well. So, we're not done yet, but those are some of the milestones and treatments that we've seen, and now go back one last time to go over some detection and monitoring techniques, because, and those go hand in hand, because you can easily adapt any detection techniques for monitoring. So I'll take you back again to 1928 when the first pap smear was used to diagnose cervical cancer in 1930. The first mammogram was used to diagnose breast cancer, but it wasn't until 1976 that mammograms became widespread and encouraged by the American Cancer Society. And in 1993, goriac fecal aqua blood testing was used for col colorectal cancer. And in 2010, the first widespread lung cancer, cancer screening trial was begun, followed by the PCCO cancer screening trial for colorectal cancer. And finally, 2016 saw the first FDA-approved liquid biopsy in cancer detection. So now, the interesting thing to look at for this, and the reason why I took you through all that, not just to hear my own voice, um, so we see this trend that is brewing in oncology research, and it's establishing this imbalance, so to speak, where there is a huge stress being placed on understanding mechanisms and developing tailored treatments. But these two can only go so far without being able to detect cancer earlier and with higher accuracy. So we need to put a bigger stress on detection and monitoring techniques as we go forward. And one area of research is holding the promise that it could help restore this balance in oncology research, and that is liquid biopsies. So liquid biopsies have arisen to meet that need for early, easy, quick cancer detection. So the current standard in diagnosis of cancer are tissue biopsies, and these are actually quite impractical and even dangerous to patients because they often require highly invasive surgery and extensive study in labs, and this can become a very lengthy process, and in most cases, tumors cannot be easily accessible by surgery as they put patients in danger. In addition, Tumor tissue biopsies can only be taken once throughout the course of treatment, so it only provides one small snapshot, snapshot in time. Um, and there's only a small overview of one tiny area of the tumor. And when a tumor grows, the cells naturally mutate, and that creates different clones of the same disease around the tumor. But with a tissue biopsy, you can only overview one of those clones and analyze one of them. Liquid biopsies, on the other hand, are minimally to non-invasive, often only requiring a patient to provide a blood sample. Because of this, sampling is easy and analysis is quick. In addition, you can take multiple blood samples throughout the course of treatment, so you can have an entire molecular overview of disease from diagnosis and throughout treatment. Liquid biopsies are often a combination of healthy and tumor DNA, which not only encapsulates that heterogeneity that you see from the multiple clones, but you can also quantitate common mutations. So when scientists think about developing these liquid biopsies, however, there are multiple candidates that they can use. I will just focus on two of them. That would be CFDNA and exosomes. So CFDNA, which is known as cell-free DNA, is found circulating in the blood, and you can extract it and then analyze it from there to get information on disease. However, and this is currently the gold standard in liquid biopsy um, development, However, there are still a few drawbacks to them, the main being that in a liquid biopsy, you want to have a one-off test where you can analyze multiple areas of disease. And so you want to do tests on DNA, RNA, and protein. But with CFDNA, you can only get information from DNA. So one area of research, which I'm sure from my talk title you can guess which one, um, promises that it can be a solution to this, and that would be exosomes. Now, before I get 
into exosomes, I want to go back really quickly to talk about a point on the timeline. And this is um, in 1947 when Sidney Farber had one of the most radical ideas in the history of cancer research. And he was confined for years in the darkened basement hallways of a children's hospital where he decided he was going to focus on childhood leukemia, a disease based in blood. And his decision to study leukemia would change not only how cancer was to be treated, but also how it was to be studied as well. So his first trials in leukemia were actually a stunning failure. Um, he was inspired by studies on anemia, which is a disease that is also based in blood. And these studies that he uh, took inspiration from found that a substance called folate could cure anemic individuals. So Farber reckoned that if folate could quote unquote normalize the blood of people with anemia, it could in turn normalize the blood of children with leukemia. However, he failed to understand the molecular mechanisms behind folate. So folate works to increase cell division, and blood cells are among the most highly proliferating cells in the body. So aiding their cell division can help anemic individuals. But leukemia is a problem because it, it's caused by blood cells dividing too frequently in the first place. So when Farber gave this folate to kids with leukemia, his results were, to put it lightly, unsuccessful. So these children who were given folate experienced a hastening or an acceleration of disease and accused of hastening the deaths of these children. Farber was unsurprisingly pushed further away from mainstream cancer studies. So while his first trials were not successful, he did go on to discover that antifolates, the antagonists of folates, can cause remission in children with leukemia. And much like Farber when he first started in the world of oncology, exosomes were very underrated. They were originally seen as minimally useful, used as trash compartments, basically, to carry cell debris out of cells and other unwanted items. However, research into exosomes has increased exponentially over the past decade or so, and it is found that these are actually important in many different aspects of life. And they carry important, important signaling molecules, such as DNA, RNA, and protein, and are important in vital cell processes, such as cell signaling, cell growth, and cell differentiation. But why exosomes? What benefit do they have over other liquid biopsy candidates? Firstly, they are ubiquitous, meaning they, can be, they are excreted from all cell types and can be extracted from a variety of bodily fluids. Now, this is helpful because it, can, it means that we can create liquid biopsies specific for different areas of the body. Secondly, they are a source of DNA, RNA, and protein, and can, you can create a one-off test, like I mentioned earlier, to analyze all different aspects of disease. They represent cellular origin, which means they contain information on the cells they came from, so we can get information from tumors this way. Also, tumors are found to release exosomes at a higher rate, which provides a, um, an increase in tumor information that we can take from the blood. And they are also more stable than other candidates as they can protect their uh, cargo in a membrane. So just for time's sake, I'm going to skip over this. But during my time in England, I have worked um, with exosomes and establishing some protocols to use in the lab that I'm working with. So as was said earlier, I work with Dr. Jackie Shaw, who is an expert in liquid biopsies. So she thought that her lab could do well to work with exosomes. So after going through many months of trying to per per perfect these protocols, um, and I just wanted to show you a quick image of exosomes, and they don't really look like much, and they look very blubby, but they're, they're actually pretty going to be, I hope, pretty important. But I was lucky enough to actually use patient samples to help determine the clinical viability of exosomes. And so this is a disease timeline of one of the patients that I had. And as you can see with all these, um, don't have a pointer, so I have to be archaic, but all of these triangles um, are different points where either the disease progressed or they had treatment that responded to treatment and then all the blood samples that they took. So just for reference, this is the um, blood sample that I used. And so we can take this information and compare it to um, information that they already got from CFDNA. So this black line here shows levels of CFDNA um, in the blood at these different time points. And it is interesting to note that increased concentration of CFDNA often correlates with um, the severity of disease. So from this, we can see that the patient went through lots of dynamic changes um, throughout the course of their disease. But the important part here is this blue line. So this characterizes a mutation in the estrogen receptor. And an estrogen re mutations in the estrogen receptor are very common in breast cancer. 
So at this time point here, um, this is my exosome information, and I detected two different mutations in this estrogen receptor, and it's, it was exciting because the information that I got matched exactly with the information that they had from cfDNA that they had already sequenced in the past. Now, this was really exciting because it showed that not only could you use exosome DNA and, and identify common mutations in cancer, but you could also clinically relate it to cfDNA, which is generally an accepted clinical practice. So there's a few next steps that need to be taken, including having consensus in the field of exosomes because having worked in it for a few months, it's, it's kind of annoying how little consensus there is right now because there's not even a firm definition of exosomes. Everyone kind of has their own idea of what they are. And also, you, you're kind of on your own in um, exosome techniques. There's no standardization of extraction or analysis. Um, also, more studies into exoRNA and exoprotein will need to be done to see if it can, can be used as that one-off test. And then, as with all scientific inquiry, you need to repeat it many times. So, entering a new world can be scary, and there's many challenges that, that we face. And cancer is a multi-headed beast, and there, it changes as fast as new information is unveiled on it, unveiled about it. But exosomes may provide many solutions that cancer um, presents to us, and I think that makes them vesicles that are worthy of our future. Thank you.